Good morning, uh, Stan Gerson, Dean of the School, and I'm gonna give you the state of the school. So first of all, thank you for putting up with uh, the world that we're currently living in, both on campus, hybrid. Um, we're all uh, contemplating COVID's next move. It's obviously not giving up, so neither can we. And I take that uh, comment seriously. We'll adjust our schedules, our approaches, as COVID makes us do. Um, You've got new leadership of the school, uh, a new leadership team, which I want to take you through. Um, we're aligning with a strategic plan, which I hope you can look at on our web page. Um, we want to be as responsive as we possibly can be, as flexible in supporting uh, student issues, needs, uh, faculty, uh, and staff in a coordinated fashion. So I think we're doing a pretty good job, and I need your feedback to keep doing that good job. I just want to remind you that we formally installed now for about a year and a half, Leah Logio as Vice Dean for Medical Education. Marvin is vi as Vice Dean for Medical Education. We have two new uh, society deans, Angelique and uh, Jason, and our newest uh, person on the leadership team is Amanda Brower, uh, who just joined us a month ago um, in internal communications, uh, and you'll get to know her. She's terrific and will be our uh, helping us with our voice and our uh, front page, if you will, uh, for the School of Medicine. And then for faculty, uh, we've reorganized with Cynthia Kubu as uh, Vice Dean for Faculty, Blanton Tolbert as Vice Dean for Diversity, Equity, Inclusive Excellence, Monica for uh, student-facing activities, um, and has been very, very effective. And for faculty, Susan Freemark, who again has with, been with us for a little over a year, who's really helping with, diver, uh, with uh, faculty issues as they emerge and for helping all of us through our promotion tenure process and leadership training, which we really want to broaden out. And Tina Lining, who's been very helpful both globally for this school and at the department and faculty level in helping us with a diversity, equity, inclusive um, engagement uh, and sensitivity, which I think we all need. I want to just point out and thank Mark Chance, who spent a decade uh, really invigorating the school in his role as Vice Dean for Research um, and in Innovation and, and Technology Transfer Efforts. Uh, he has had a huge impact on the school, uh, and we'll hear more about that uh, later, but I want to appreciate him uh, publicly for what he did and continues to have uh, impact on our school and its research programs. We have a number of searches going on through the school. I hope to be finalizing candidates uh, in the next couple of weeks in pharmacology. We have an active search ongoing for vice dean of research. Um, we are starting a search for the director of the Case Comprehensive Cancer Center. It's about time I stop doing all of these activities. And uh, likewise, National Center for Regenerative Medicine. And I'm looking for a chief of staff for the dean's office. I had dinner last night with a, a small party who chuckled about the topic of having a chief of staff. And I reminded them how desperately I needed one. So hopefully that'll happen. Uh, there are uh, a number of active chair searches going on. Two at UH that are listed here, one at the VA and one at Metro, and three at uh, the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, all of those, I think, will add value uh, to our faculty and the approach that we take across this quite large enterprise. I like to think of this enterprise as a faculty of medicine, some 3,200 strong across five campuses with our uh, joint activities in education at the Health Education Campus. It's a powerful engine for what we all do. I'll also remind you that the newest building, if you will, is at Metro Health, where they will have a new uh, medical center. Uh, and that's been augmented for connectivity through uh, the Innovation Corridor, or sorry, the Opportunities Corridor, which runs either ends or starts at 105th Street. Uh, but you can now be door to door office to office um, and seat to seat in about 15 minutes. So there's really no reason not to think of uh, Metro Health as being quite close by. Um, if you think about the walk to the VA or walk between uh, uh, the Case Campus and the Cleveland Clinic Campus, it's about 12 minutes. So 
Metro Health is just about as close. So I want us to think about one faculty across those efforts. So what do we do? Well, we are research intensive. I just want to point out the accomplishments of many, many, many people to lead us to have this many huge center type grants, both the CTSA, the Cancer Center, which you all know about, the diabetes uh, effort and center, a huge number of grants happening with the Alzheimer's, uh, in the Alzheimer's space, and uh, James Leverens, who just received our uh, renewed Alzheimer's uh, disease research uh, P30 grant. So I want to uh, recognize all of those efforts. Uh, there are huge amounts of work. Uh, Sandy has just resubmitted his GI spore. We hope that does well. Um, these are big grants. They make us uh, who we are. Other uh, major grants that are longstanding uh, are shown here in a variety of areas. Another P30 that uh, Dr. Cominelli has, uh, a P01, uh, George Dubiak has three grants in the HIV space um, uh, with Uganda uh, colleagues um, that Bob Salata, Henry Boom, and John Karn have, uh, as well as major grants in MS, ethics, and in sickle cell. So these are major efforts, um, again, innovative build outs of what we all do and incredible accomplishments on the part of our. Uh, senior faculty. I want to point out also four major grants in the COVID era. Uh, one that Nora Singer and Grace McCompsey have that to study long COVID, which may be even longer than we thought, given this new variant. Um, uh, a major grant in that area that will cover a couple of years and bring a, a better understanding of what we're experiencing here in Northeast Ohio uh, in the COVID space. Um, at the individual level, uh, these are the grants in the, just in the past uh, year and a half on the case UH and Metro Health uh, campuses. I won't call out each one individually. Likewise, at the Cleveland Clinic uh, campus, a series of new uh, awards, uh, which I want to just uh, make sure that we acknowledge. Um, in addition, uh, there's a, a one more P01 that Ed Plow and, and Dan Simon have in the middle of this page uh, that are combined efforts. At the R01 level, uh, you continue individually to have your uh, grant successes, which I'm delighted to see, and we want to make sure we have the infrastructure for and support both at the research, at the um, shared resource level. Uh, so let us know what you need. Uh, we will help you um, uh, continue to be successful. And likewise, additional R01s uh, located on the Cleveland Clinic uh, campus. So uh, we are a research intensive group. Um, I'm delighted with all of these accomplishments. It's been a struggle for folks to both have their active research programs up and running. I hope you're reasonably back uh, to what you want to be uh, and the rate of intensity of research and training efforts that you do. In addition, our um, foundation development support for uh, some 60 of you have received foundation awards over the past year. Um, uh, we're running ahead of where we were last year, which I'm delighted to see. Uh, so we try to make sure that we provide these alternative sources of funding to as many of you as we can. And if we flog the system, it's because we can be remarkably successful uh, with foundation awards. So I think I double clicked. I did. So we've put back up onto the uh, website a strategic plan, which I've modified a little bit. Um, it's about time for us to relook at it. Um, we began this process a year ago. So it's just about the right time to jigger what we need to do differently. So I'd love feedback from you. Uh, at the uh, dean's level, we'll start to drill down about what we want to change and modify uh, from it. I'm not going to go into the details of it here, but I will reflect on it for the next few minutes about some of the major issues that I see as um, some of our priorities. I'll just remind you the mission that's in that strategic plan to improve glo health globally by linking research to populations in a superb educational environment. And our environment here across our five campuses is really quite remarkable. Uh, and I think the way we, we will be successful is to utilize the extraordinary consortium of our medical school faculty across all of our 
uh, Cleveland Medical Institutions to create integrated teams of experts, that's why I showed you those multi-investigator grants, uh, to educate our trainees, link disciplines to discover the mysteries of and the treatment for serious diseases, and to understand and eliminate health, dispar health disparities and inequities in Cleveland and across the world, um, I think it'll take us some time to accomplish those goals. I'd like to start uh, talking about our education program. Uh, this year we um, brought in 216 students across the three um, medical school programs. Uh, we have 56 new PhD students, uh, 491 students enrolled in our various master's programs, which are quite vigorous, uh, and we're delighted with our success at advanced degree placement. Of course, it takes us a little bit of time to make sure we know just how well our students are doing. And we have an entrepreneurial program with five postdoctoral fellows. So this is a very rigorous, I think, and dynamic education environment that we have. I'd like us to think about some new opportunities um, in our education efforts. Um, one is to, make, make, uh, to give more attention to our community projects. We have a well-run student um, uh, clinic. We have interprofessional education that provides a community environment opportunity. But I think in this day and age, all of us need to pay more attention to our community. I'd like to see our uh, PhDs in basic laboratories take more time and effort thinking about epidemiology and population sciences, not think of it as just something out there. Um, I think we can engage our community more in the research that we do and, and thoughtfulness both at the student level and at the professional faculty level about the impact of our research on our community. That's also reflected in our medical education pathways, which are quite robust now and frankly getting better with more attention by our medical students in world health, entrepreneurship, advocacy, wellness, humanities, urban uh, health, and um, I'd like us to, to spend more time on uh, climate change. We're about 12, 14 years into the university program and the college program. I've asked those two to think carefully about their curriculum and do a deep dive into some of the best practices. What can we do better? How can we educate each other on, on the approach that we take uh, to training our medical students? Um, it is remarkable to me that we had the um, uh, program in 1952 that we called the blocks, and then we came up with WR2. They're all crusty. How in the world is it that we teach our medical students the same stuff every year for 10 or 20 years? Uh, I don't get it. So it's time for us to rejigger and think more, much more proactively about how we want to do a little bit of an upheaval to keep our medical education as current as it possibly can be. Likewise, our graduate PhD programs are crusty. This is the way you get a PhD in, your, in this program, whatever this program is. And yet, our students get a PhD from Case. And I don't get it. I don't understand why there's 12 different methods uh, that students pick and choose to get their PhDs. We should be much more consistent with the approach we take to the thesis requirements across our PhD programs. The chairs don't like it. The program leaders don't like it. <coughs> but I need you all to get together and come up with a way that we train our PhDs. Diversity, equity, inclusive excellence um, has been an initiative that we're all learning uh, about. Uh, Blanton Tolbert has been very proactive. He's just getting his engines going. He has a lot to advise us on and teach us about diversity, equity, and inclusive excellence, as does the university. We have inadequate diversity amongst our faculty and students. I'll go into some of those details. We need better support and training and discussions about racism, bias, microaggression. It's amazing what we can all learn. Um, we are um, more proactive about how we're training our uh, committees uh, that are recruiting. Uh, I've initiated a dean's postdoc to faculty scholars program. We need uh, and our intent to support about three or four students a year that are coming out of our own uh, graduate programs. Um, and I'd like us to see and be able to move 
a cohort of students a year to faculty positions in five to six years. Uh, we have the students here from diverse backgrounds. I'd like us to keep them here. Blanton submitted the first award, and based on that, uh, and we'll see whether it gets funded this round or not, but I think we can also undertake a first program within the School of Medicine uh, that seeks out diverse candidates and, the, and allows them into various of our departments. If we ask each department to include in their search activities an effort to think about a diverse population, it gets bogged down. I think we should put a concerted effort into that, uh, and Blanton and I are working on those details. So what about our admission class at the MD level? <laughs> They've done remarkably well because they work really hard at this effort. So um, a little more than 19% of our students are from underrepresented backgrounds. 10% uh, are recognize themselves as LGBTQ. Uh, 8% um, are first generation in their family to go to college. 3% uh, are from highly rural areas. Uh, more than 54% uh, are women. And the um, MD program uh, looks hard at where our students came from. And there's a, a methodology called distance traveled, which if you think about it, makes a huge amount of sense. And it allows us to understand just how hard they trafficked before they could apply to and be accepted into our program. Having 31 students with a distance traveled score of 20, I recognize that you wouldn't know what that mean, is really high, and I'm delighted that we've taken the effort to understand where our students come from. They will all make a difference uh, in their careers going forward. What's the diversity amongst our PhD trainees and our faculty? Well, that's a little bit more complex, so 14% of all of our PhDs are from underrepresented or marginalized groups, but 20% from this year's class. Uh, we work hard to attract students from our uh, post bac program, from our prep, from our R25 program, and I think that's why we're seeing that increment up. It's very, very hard in the MSTP program. Uh, there's smaller numbers of, and proportions of underrepresented groups, but two of our 14 of our students uh, this year uh, are so represented. Our faculty is a, I don't know, to be honest with you, we think it's around 3% of our School of Medicine and 5% of our hospital-based um, faculty. But since we self-report, you'll, you'll see that uh, uh, more than 560 of us um, have decided that we don't want to uh, uh, identify ourselves uh, by any uh, racial or ethnic uh, or um, even major, majority uh, population. So actually, I don't know what our faculty constituents are, and we would like to find out, and we're going to try a little harder this year to ask for you to let us know. Um, we might ask more directly. What are our goals? Well, we want to maintain our medical student uh, pool um, here at uh, uh, above 24%. Likewise, we'd like to get to 24% for our a graduate school program. We are being more active with historically back colleges and universities in terms of our MD and our PhD programs. I've put out a request that our faculty recruits aim for 15% from underrepresented groups. It's currently much lower than that. So we'd like to get there. And I mentioned the Dean Scholars Program, which is just getting initiated. And I'm delighted that the Learner Research Institute has agreed to partake as well and add to that effort. So I think if we can um, keep three of our students uh, from our underrepresented groups and move them into faculty positions over the next five years uh, on a yearly basis, that would be terrific. I want to go back to that mission statement and focus on the extraordinary consortium we have across our faculty. Um, I mentioned this before, and I sort of mean it. Um, uh, we have remarkable competencies and capabilities if we look across the efforts that we do. Uh, there are very few of our multi-investigator efforts which happen well at one institution. They take two, three, four, or five of us at the institution level. And I'm going to go through these six examples. Um, I'll start with the Compre <coughs> Comprehensive Cancer Center. I guess I happen to know it pretty well. 
Um, <clears throat> we're known across the country as the first center to have a two-year extension to a total of seven years for our NCI designation because of our excellence and exceptional performance uh, for two consecutive reviews. Uh, we are about, I hope, to announce uh, the recruitment of the next uh, TOSIC Cancer Institute uh, director, who is a, a um, deputy director for the Comprehensive Cancer Center. We're going to start, and we'll need all of your help to find the best person that we can um, to identify the next NCI designated cancer center for the Comprehensive Cancer Center. We'll start that in the next couple of weeks. We've been struggling for decades, frankly, of how to interconnect our clinical investigators with our research teams, and we've developed this concept with the Cancer Center members know well of disease ribbons, which are really designed to ask us how do we interface best between our clinical activities and clinical research activities at our hospitals, university hospitals, Cleveland Clinic, which are with our disease teams, which are cutting across each of our institutions. We're hopeful that we can be more proactive taking advantage of the expertise we have in clinical care and clinical research and tie them into our research programs. I had dinner last night with uh, leaders of Metro Health to help them recognize the importance and value. Uh, we will be delighted to have them join our cancer center, but they've got to meet uh, our criteria that you can see here. Uh, and uh, they have a long way to go. And if, if we, they can help us uh, by making the investments, we'd love to have them join. Uh, formally, they're certainly their faculty are, but as an institution, they're not there yet. The reason it works, in addition to the faculty and the coordination, is we have three deputy directors, James, uh, uh, who's interim, uh, Alan and Ted, um, each overseeing um, either the two hospitals or the research program uh, for the Comprehensive Cancer Center, and the incredible and significant involvement and supervision of our um, institutional leaders at, at the level of our Board of Governors, led by Eric Kaler as president with Cliff Majerian and Tom Mihalovich. So having the institutional leaders support our activities is critical to the success of the Cancer Center. Um, another way that we have infiltrated and um, manage the fabric of research across the organizations is now uh, more than a 20-year program of training of our junior faculty in our K-12 uh, Scholars Program, which I've been delighted to be able to lead for the last um, 18 years with the significant support of uh, Alex uh, Wong. And uh, look at the faculty here that have been trained in our K-12 and the importance they play in our clinical research mission across our hospitals. Most of our key investigators have been trained in that K-12 program in the cancer space. And if I move on to the Clinical Translational Science Collaborative, which is just about to put its new uh, next competitive submission in in May uh, of 22, again, it's a cross-institutional effort uh, that brings together the clinical translational research infrastructure um, across organizations. Uh, at the renewal, it will have new associate PIs, a new PI. It's got a strong community orientation to the research effort and an extensive training program that will be put together over the next few months. Uh, it likewise, in its current construct, has active involvement across our institutions, provides critical infrastructure support for our clinical and translational research efforts, has very, very strong training programs led by Cliff and Riyad, uh, and again, um, a board of governors that were, I'm, I've asked to be put together uh, through Eric Kaler that would involve Tom uh, Akram and Cliff as the CEOs of the hospitals. We absolutely require and need those institutional support efforts for us to continue our uh, critical research um, involvement. And likewise, their trainees have been important at the PhD level, which I've shown here, and more importantly at the KL2 level, where again, many of our cl key clinical investigators for clinical and translational research came through our program in the KL2 over the past uh, decade and are active investigators uh, across our institutions. So 
the KL2 program and the K12 program have offered almost $40 million of offsets of hospital-based support for faculty over the past 20 years. You can't do it without these major grants. Likewise, I think there's a huge opportunity in brain health. And we've initiated this. It's stumbling a little bit, but I think we will, are about to rebrand it um, with help of our key investigators in a brain health consortium. Uh, what I'd like to do is put together a group with one individual per institution um, to help uh, at the executive level. I, I, I see eight different areas, sort of like how a cancer center thinks of itself, uh, where program uh, uh, can be brought forward in neurodegeneration, cognitive sciences, trauma, vision, deep brain stimulation, neural engineering, rehabilitation, and tumors. Again, we've got expertise across our institutions. Five of these areas have P and U multi-investigator grants. I think they can all brew it forward. And you saw from that earlier slide of Alzheimer's just how much competency and expertise we have in this space. It's obvious a huge area of medical need. Right now, we have four leads that have, helped, that have agreed to come uh, with this group to help expand the effort. Um, the school wants to make sure that we uh, uh, can bring this across our institutions and really build uh, multi-investigator teams. And I hope we identify someone at the Cleveland Clinic uh, soon to help out uh, with their coordinated activities. Likewise, moving on to urban and, uh, and population health, uh, Sherry, Kurt, Jim, and Darcy have been in communication with me about opportunities we have to really broaden out our impact um, both regionally and nationally. I think our region certainly needs help. We have commitments across uh, the Cleveland, Cleveland State, uh, the Cuyahoga Board of, of Health, uh, with, with um, the uh, School of, uh, of Social Sciences, School of Law, um, and across the, the consortium of faculty in, this, in the School of Medicine. The opportunity of continued research advancement is huge here. Uh, we've got interest on the part of Jobs Ohio for a community task force. Um, I've been uh, recently involved with the Sisters of Charity and talking with them about advances that we can do with, for their new redefined health uh, campus uh, downtown. I think we all appreciate there's a lot we don't know about how to make our community healthier. Um, we can identify social determinants of health, but we really don't understand the biologic factors that lead to disease. We can talk about poverty and food insecurity. How do we fix them isn't so easy, and I think it's time for us to put our minds to this. And I will just call out Dexter Voisin, who's a, na a name you probably don't know, uh, but you will, who's coming here in January as the new dean for the Mandel School of Social Sciences. He has been a community activist, uh, is currently at the University of Toronto, um, uh, will be a very, very strong voice in understanding systemic racism. Uh, the next space that has been remarkably successful is cell and gene therapy. Most of you probably don't think about this every day, but Tim, William, and I do. Uh, Tim and William lead the programs at Cleveland Clinic and at Metro Health. Um, we had our annual Board of Governors meeting uh, yesterday um, where we talked about the expansion of services for cell and gene therapy across our hospitals with major investments at the Cleveland Clinic, Metro, and at UH. Uh, and we have a robust team uh, uh, leading commercial uh, um, partnerships with a variety of entities, including Athersys, which has been a longstanding partner, but both national and international. Minovia is uh, a small biotech in Israel who will do its first mitochondrial, gene tr uh, mitochondrial transfer here in Cleveland. And again, this works because we have a strong uh, governance board across all of these institutions that support the efforts that we're making. Commercial partnerships is, is an area which I think, again, has been um, um, uh, sort of a grassroots effort that uh, in large part uh, Mark Chance um, energized for the past decade. Uh, the opportunities that we have to build a workforce in Cleveland is huge, <clears throat> and the activities that we have are remarkable. I think it's now time for us to build out 
um, incubator space that leads to small biotech companies here in Cleveland. I think we want to train a workforce to be able to do so, be encouraging for people to move out of our academic space into the commercial environment. The state realizes that opportunity with, and is providing matching funds to the tune of $150 million across our institutions. The Cleveland Clinic is planning to build three biotech buildings as well as those uh, cell and gene therapy efforts. Uh, UH is, is going to spend these resources on recruitments. CASE is going to spend them on infrastructure and biotech. Um, we know that we've got strong institutional support from CA and Coulter, and we can now plan the commercialization strategies around an alumni fund, venture funds, and foundation funds. And so I think we're getting that um, enterprise going. Uh, having a chemical engineer president of the university, it's not very tough for the guy to realize that this is a huge opportunity um, that he can um, partner with both commercial efforts and local efforts and statewide efforts to pursue. Just an example of some of our successes in the past uh, couple of years, again, uh, helped and supported by Mark Chance, uh, Luminary, which is a spin out uh, from Reshmi uh, Parmerjwanian, who is developing a BAF CAR T, which hopefully will begin in clinical trials in the next six to 12 months. A clinical trial is now ongoing internationally with a Toronto-based company called NerveGen, um, which licensed out the work of Jerry Silver. Uh, that's in clinical trials now for spinal cord disease. And these others um, are, are prominent and finally have commercial partners and are rolling out their preclinical to clinical uh, efforts. And so I'm delighted that we really do have a critical mass and pipeline across multiple disciplines. What about our finances? <laughs> Well, we all know that uh, the school took four or five years to overcome the ripple of the two 2016 adjustment in resources that were provided to the school from the hospitals. Of course, last year was a remarkably challenging year for all of us uh, with an overall 10% cost reduction of a huge base of work. Our research spending was down some $31 million, which makes it a little harder for us to manage our indirect cost recovery. Uh, but our master's enrollment, uh, student enrollment went up. Our grant submissions went up. Um, we did recover a half year of Plan A, and we ended with enough resources that we could then build out the space um, for neurosciences that we promised, for the um, nutrition kitchen that we promised, and we are looking forward to being in enough positive balance uh, this coming year that we'll be able to move on to the next major uh, renovation projects that we need to be able to do. I mentioned our foundation support, but overall attainment, um, as you can see, uh, is um, coming in quite well. I'll remind you that the uh, FY year ends in, in June, so we're almost halfway through. This is just a, a five-month ca five catch-up, if you will, of the current year. We anticipate the overall attainment will go up, faculty support, scholarship, research support, and our catalytic funds, I'm optimistic, will be ahead of where they were last year. We're enlarging the development team, um, and they do provide a remarkable, a remarkable amount of support for hundreds of our investigators. So where are we going? Um, areas that I see as opportunities for us at the school level are to really coordinate our undergraduate program. Uh, I have to give credit to the departments of nutrition, neurosciences, and biochemistry, who basically, on their own, develop remarkable and very, very successful undergraduate programs. But the school needs a coordinated imprint to support them as they do so and as they expand. There are enough moving parts um, at the undergraduate level that the school needs to be um, very clear and uh, appropriate in, in its intentions and support for these efforts. And after all, where do we get our graduate students? We get them from undergraduate programs. So we want to be helpful with these three majors. There's also a minor in um, uh, ethics, and I think we can move these efforts forward. I talked about population implementation science. I see huge opportunity for us to further expand that, both within the Department of PQHS across our 
faculty at all of our campuses and in other disciplines and areas as well through the CTSA, through the Cancer Center, and the like. I think we're ready to start taking on our own effort in gene corrective uh, therapies. The molecular biology has moved along. The technologies have moved along. We have the patient base. I think we can develop our own on-site gene corrective therapies for the patients that we see. I haven't mentioned much about artificial intelligence and data science, but it's a keen area of expansion, both in engineering and in uh, biomedical engineering, and interests apart across many of our disciplines. Uh, it's an area that I think we can expand out and take advantage of uh, through the School of Engineering and interactions with our uh, Faculty of Medicine. Additional master's programs, although the ones that are existent are doing incredibly well, include um, a new area of FDA regulatory science. I think we can move this into a full master's program. We've got a remarkable amount of competencies here. Similarly, in entrepreneurship, if we're going to build a biotech workforce, we should be able to train them. Uh, the master's program in pharmacology was just approved, and a joint master's program across a number of disciplines in biotechnology is moving ahead. I think we want to make sure that when we train, we find jobs. And so I've encouraged all of our master's programs to be more attentive to how do we make sure the quality of what we produce is high and that we can help train uh, those individuals for a workforce either locally or nationally. <clears throat> I'd like us to look carefully and seriously at our tenure process and the roles of our senior faculty. There's no reason we can't make all of us more successful and engaged in our missions. Um, and to have folks not sure of their role here uh, is not good for any of us, either at the individual department or school level. I've talked a lot about uh, Biotech Cleveland. I think it's an area that we want to see much more robust. There's no reason we can't think of ourselves as brewing a whole variety of technologies that we roll out into commercial spaces. Uh, we would like our faculty to be inventors, to be founders, and to spend a little bit of time every week with that company they started up the street or down the street. That would be just fine with me. And finally, um, <clears throat> I'd like us to think of a new area, and that is uh, climate change and health. <laughs> it's an area that uh, I suppose on the political space can be somewhat um, controversial. So I'd just like to end with uh, this picture of the Harding Ice Field, and I'm glad Cliff is here. I don't think this was named after you, but probably President Harding. So um, I think that's. <laughs> So uh, I was on uh, a hiking trip with my son, and uh, I'm not sure if I have a pointer, but uh, can I pull up? Yeah, so there's David. You can see him out at the edge. Uh, he got closer than I dared to go. Um, so this ice field is a huge, probably 14 square mile ice field at around 4,000 feet that we hiked up to in, uh, in uh, southern Alaska. Uh, on a trip there. Uh, the next day it snowed about a foot and a half and we wouldn't be able to get up to see it. Um, and off to the left is the exit glacier, um, which we saw signs as we uh, drove up to the base uh, camp. Um, it had receded more than four miles in the past 50 years. And you can imagine that this ice field was probably two or 300 feet higher 40 years ago. So um, we're exp experiencing climate change. Our Seagal has just begun a climate change and health um, uh, course. Uh, Bud Isaacson, uh, who uh, is the executive dean for the college program for our medical students, is beginning a course structure in climate change. I think it's time for all of us to pay more attention to the health impacts of climate change. Uh, we all think of it as something that happens elsewhere or in our backyards, but not necessarily in our laboratories or our educational environment. I think there's huge opportunity for us to sort of think more seriously about where climate change is in our research, in our patient care, in our health care, in our population assessments, and our understanding of, of both uh, its impact on environment, on heat, on cold, on crisis management. So I think it's time for us to be thinking about climate change. And if, if 
if I can imagine, after we get through COVID, the next health effort is going to be in climate. So I think it's time for us to think, where can we impact the world of climate change and our own research? So that's the state of the school. I'd love to take comments or questions. Thank you. that I can get out of this and see if I can find myself to questions. I don't know if I can. I'm not doing it there. Is there a way for me to understand if there's anything in the... Uh... I thought I could try to figure out if there's... If there's um, Chats. If not, I'll take questions here. Or both, I'll take questions here. You think? No. Escape. All right, the one question, and then if, if there are any in the audience, I'll be glad to. Um, train, retrain and train hand hardworking staff within the School of Medicine. So there's, I think this is a question about staff. So I just had a conversation with someone yesterday who um, commented that the school has gotten itself in this stitch that our staff find it easier to upgrade their position by leaving than by being promoted. Um, sounds pretty stupid. Uh, sounds real. And so I, um, I actually do want, and I've seen it at our hospitals, be much more intentional about creating pathways so that staff could anticipate with staff support in training um, job elevations, either within their entity or next door. But if we're intentional about it, there's just no reason why staff shouldn't elevate their positions, either in the same path that they're doing or switching along, but that the next person should be ready to come along. And I don't see why we're thinking of ourselves of hiring people that are stagnant in their positions. How to solve it, I'm not exactly sure, but I'm certainly sensitive to it. Um, we all should have a career path forward. So that's a global comment, and we'll figure out the details. Um, uh, so there's a question about biomedical health informatics. So. Um, uh, it's a subset, frankly, of the larger question of, as we graduate masters, where are the jobs? And I, I don't think we should have a master's program without a job pathway. So I get it completely. Uh, we've done this in the regenerative medicine masters, which is a brand new masters, and we're placing everybody. So um, we do have to be able to find uh, job opportunities. Um, my concern is actually the opposite, that we can't keep them here because they'll, they'll make more money elsewhere. But I think part of our master's program effort um, has to be helping and assistance in finding jobs and also making sure that the pathway of the training is such that there's a job um, that they can look forward to when they graduate. Yeah? Um, thanks very much for taking on the job and, and, and the presentation today. One of the concerns that I have is a number of years ago, we went from having sort of individual support staff in, in research areas to the hub system, which took away a little bit of the personality within those areas, but that's okay. The hubs are working nicely, but at least in my own department of radiology and, and some in engineering, the hubs have have become almost dysfunctional as people have left because of COVID. And so I wanted to know where is, um, because this is important for grant submission, et cetera, and, and revenue income to the university, where is uh, fixing that issue a priority on your scale? 
Right. So um, uh, let's face it, the Great Resignation is a nationwide item that you can read about every day in the newspaper or watch on TV or whatever you're doing. It's a, 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 an amazing event. And this morning's uh, job um, uh, report, they thought there were going to be uh, 580,000 new people in the workforce, and there were 240,000 people in the work added to the workforce. So it's a national issue. So guess what? I don't have any better solution than the nation does. We here had a remarkable freeze on salaries and on positions. When the president came in, um, his um, messaging has gradually and I'm, I say this carefully, gradually filtered down to the people who directly report to the president. And I guess you might know who those are. Gradually. Finally, um, we're starting to hear at the school a little bit of uh, flexibility um, at the interfaces between who we can hire, how much we can pay them, what those job descriptions are. Okay? If individuals decide they're going to um, retire or leave, they do it for two reasons. One is that they can get paid elsewhere better, or the job lifestyle is better. So you've also seen a little bit more late but flexible approach to the hybrid space, which you know when we started in July, we were told no hybrids, everybody has to show up at work. So there's many ways to show up at work. Um, uh, I don't think I'm hearing a lot of people complaining to me the work isn't getting done by people who are here. The, people isn't get, the work isn't being done by the people who left. So that's a different problem. So I understand it. I'm sensitive to it. I'm totally in line with what the president's trying to do, just that the um, workforce management of his subordinates has been remarkably slow. But there's movement. So I think things are finally allowing us to do better. And yes, I get it. You need people in the hubs to help you with your grant applications. I'm not confused about that at all. So we're, we're trying to get there. Yeah. Let me just answer this question here. Um, appreciate hearing the efforts to recruit a more diverse faculty, but I didn't hear anything specifically about efforts to, to in place to retain these faculty once they join the fact, uh, once they join the university, can I speak to that, please? Well, it's an important area. I, I'm not quite sure I understand um, why I should be worried about a diverse faculty being retained than any faculty being retained, since I view a major responsibility of the deanship is to retain our faculty. So, I get it. We're all different. We all have different needs and efforts and issues, but it's a global phenomenon. It's not just about one or two faculty in a minority group or whatever. It's the culture. It's the environment. It's the it's how we support faculty. So we have a new uh, faculty team, which I showed you, faculty support team, which I showed you, and they're really good. And they are gradually infiltrating across our departments at the individual faculty level whether it be Blanton or, or Tina or Susan or Cynthia, we're here to help, and the team recognizes that. So I think you should be able to find the support that you need. Now, a different level, and it's a conversation that Blanton is very proactive about, and that is providing a better culture and environment. The truth of the matter is there are 10, 15 different culture groups that we want to pay attention to, not one or two. Um, you know, if you really look at the diversity of our faculty, it's quite broad, and their interests and their styles and their approaches and where they like to go to restaurants are all completely different, which is great. And we need to both pay attention, call out, and support every component. So um, it's a broad area. I'm never sensitive enough to it, but it's much more complicated than a diverse faculty concept. It's all of us. So, yes. 
So, Stan, you and I have had this conversation, and I think it would be helpful for the faculty to sort of hear what we talked about. So, I said to you one day when I learned that you were going to basically identify underrepresented minority students and then groom them throughout their postdoc to stay here and then into mentored faculty positions, that that, that is actually opposite of actually what we want and have encouraged our students in the past to do, which is to go out and spread their wings and learn about more people. And you and I had a long conversation about this, and I'm wondering if you can share with the rest of the faculty um, your response to, to my query when I asked you this, and then also comment on how we're going to make sure that as these young investigators transition into independent faculty, that they are allowed to be independent and they're not tethered to their mentors that they have had throughout their career growth? Uh, I don't have an answer. Sorry. Um, it's it's um, a, um, <clears throat> I think I heard it, witnessed it, experienced it um, when I started my fellowship, when I started here. It's part of all of our career planning and development efforts. Um, uh, I think we all recognize career paths that work and those that don't work. We all have seen uh, mentors who can't let go. Um, and the answer is we all have to witness and engage and support um, moving people into their career development paths. And it's always possible to do it, no matter where you are. You don't have to leave to do it. Um, I do think that we shortchange ourselves and our students by not encouraging them to stay and find a different experience and, and be enhanced um, in their own individual places in career development. I think the purpose of the Dean Scholars Program is actually no different than a medical student who's encouraged to stay at one of our hospitals for their residency, what's the difference? So find a different path and a different tact and learn how to be successful. And there are hundreds, maybe not hundreds, up to 100, I bet, of us here who were trained here and are very successful. I've been here my entire career. But, you know, Bob Salata um, has been here his entire career. So you can be very successful staying at one institution for your, for your entire career, even though Mukesh Jain is going to leave and go to Brown. <laughs> so many ways to be successful. I don't think you have to leave. Wait for the mic. Stan, the uh, uh, within your layout is really inspirational, and you lay out several new in, in initiatives. One of it, I think you mentioned, was uh, uh, gene correction therapy. So that uh, obviously involves uh, new technology developments, such as uh, you know improved uh, crystal cas So I, I wonder, you know, if you can elaborate more on that. So. Is the school going to recruit more faculty doing the, you know, the technology development, uh, you know, to enhance the uh, gene therapy, the gene correction therapy? Yeah, so uh, uh, the question around gene correction therapy, so it's a little bit um, uh, pie in the sky. I got that part. But we've got Chip Tilton here. We've got Mitch Drum. We've got very good genomics folks, Paul Tizar, who understand how to manipulate genomes and can imagine correcting a disorder. And we have clinicians who see diseases. And um, what we're missing is the ability to create a specific correction in a GMP space. It's actually not that hard to build it. Um, so with the vector production competencies that are going to be built around the city um, and the intention to start doing much more deep sequencing for specific disorders, 
I think we can start with developing the pipeline of how do you go from the gene abnormality to testing in either an IPS system or in a um, um, animal model system, and how do you do either a CRISPR or a RNA or whatever that need correction is, testing it out, running it through the, you know, first one takes you three years, the second one takes you six months. So I think it's actually quite doable if you break down the pieces and the parts. I don't think it starts with assuming we're ignorant and we have to recruit somebody to tell us how to do it. I think we'll build it and we'll recruit because we built it, just like the cell and gene therapy effort. So I think we can get there in five years. That's my timeline. I think we can manage it within our abilities and within the interest, which is intense, that our hospitals have. I don't see other comments or questions. Is there anything? Oh, oh, oh sorry, there's one or more here. Let me see if I can figure this out. Um, I was asked about the, I assume this issue, uh, why not open up this program nationally? I think this has to do with the Dean Scholars Program. And so um, I was quite exp this, um, uh, explicit that I wanted to support our underrepresented medical students, sorry, graduate students here to stay on for postdocs to faculty positions. I would be delighted to recruit somebody here. I don't see it happening. So not a problem to me. I'm fine. Any minority, underrepresented, marginalized student anywhere wants to come here, I'd be delighted. Somebody's got to find them. The difference is I can see the grad student today. All I have to do is ask them to stay here and give them resources and encouragement to do so. That's where I'm starting. But it's okay with me. Um, parking is a major source of frustration. Um, parking is a problem. I get it. And parking will be figured out. And I don't have an answer to parking. <laughs> I really don't. I mean, parking is its own world for any of us who live it. But I get it. That's a problem. So. All right, folks. Thank you. Keep us well. Thank you.